Hello, everyone. Um, and welcome to this third hour of streaming. Um, here with me today is, or now this hour is uh, Christos, and he, uh, he is the VP of product management. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, Although my, my crowning achievement is that you know, I'm also uh, an IDU graduate, so I, I've been at everyone's place presenting yeah. their games today. Yeah, and you've, you've also like consulted on game, game projects over the years here as well. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think we should just get to it because we're a little bit uh, behind schedule, but that's fine. And uh, the first project we're gonna talk about here is this pattern, which is uh, an online musical toy for multiple players. And with us here, we have Alberto to talk about uh, that. So, hi everyone. Uh, some of you may have seen me before on, on Darkbot, and I'm back again. And this time, again, with a multiplayer thing, but this is not really uh, a game, it's more a toy. So, let's get into it. The name is This Pattern. Uh, so, what is This Pattern? Uh, this pattern is uh, a digital toy for artistic music composition. It's a simple app on, our, on your Android phone. It's one to four players connected together and it's being connected and experimenting play. And it's also no correct way to play. And all of this will make sense now. Um, and we'll go into an actual live showcase of the game. Hoping everything will, will be all right. Um, so, when you connect to this pattern, you get assigned a color, in this case, uh, cyan. And uh, with that color, you can swipe your finger on the screen and draw some patterns. When a ball of the same color of the platform uh, touches uh, a platform and bounces off, it creates a sound. Uh, so, with this, you can create some music, and each color has their own uh, sound style. And uh, um, you can, of course, change the length of the platforms. And the longer the platform is, the lower the pitch of the sound will be. Uh, you can create up to five platforms of each color at a time. Uh, and uh, you will see in the top indicator here how many platforms you have. And if you want to delete one, you just want to escape and it will disappear. Or you can delete both of them by just pressing the you have. Um, with this, uh, you can create a wide variety of different uh, uh, rhythms and uh, some, let's say, patterns. And most of them sound really good. Uh, but the, the key feature of this game is that you can connect with people. So you may see in the background that there are some grayed out dots. And uh, when I connect with another, um, with another uh, form, some new platform will appear. That are the platform that the last Delta player left there. Uh, with this, uh, we can create some beautiful sound together and uh, match the sound styles of the different players. Uh, or uh, some some players not play by this rule, so they just use the beautiful art that we have and the attitude of our skin and the rise of the shader that we make uh, to just fill the screen with, with just platforms that look good on, on each other. Um, so now I will make some uh, more players uh, come, to the, come to the party uh, to showcase the full possibilities that this button uh, gives uh, so you see now we have all four players and it becomes really tough and you have a lot of possibilities to, uh, to play. So for example, I could uh, um, try to catch some things in a pit uh, just for the visual part of it. Uh, and the cool thing is that if more than four players connect at the same time, the new ones will be so I'd say that uh, um, 
this is kind of it uh, for this presentation. Uh, but I want to, of course, thanks all the, the other colleagues that worked with me in making this pattern possible. So Aske, Fabio, and Elena. Uh, it, the game is not available yet uh, to download, but it will be in the future. So uh, yeah, follow me on each, I guess, and someday it will be there. Thank you, Alberto. Um, that was really great. Um, really loved all the, the, the sound wildness that was in there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to give the word to Christos. And... <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Alberto, uh, for presenting it. It's really marvelous and spectacular to look at. Unfortunately, I didn't hear much of what you said because of all the sounds that it was making on the back. So I, I trust that you pitched it really, really well. Um, it's, it's, it's very beautiful to look at. Uh, and I, 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 my first question was actually whether, it, because I saw that you run it on the emulator for Android, was to, you know, to ask you if it's already available uh, to try it. But you said that it's not yet available. Um, so I want to ask you the second one, which is, having play tested and having it tried a couple of times or a lot of times what was the most interesting piece of audio or music that you accidentally created with it um i'd say that it, it you don't really notice too much of a difference uh, every time in like uh, 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 like it does you don't notice a time that is completely outstanding compared to the other ones uh, but you can notice a big difference uh, when you play it with strangers and someone just doesn't want to play by the sound part of it, but just want to create uh, a good looking piece of uh, uh, like of canvas. At that time, you notice it, it sounds a bit bad or a, a bit worse, uh, but uh, it, it's, still, it's still cool to, to play with, I, I think. Yep. So uh, have you... Uh... Have you managed? Does it work particularly well with multiple players? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, like with four players, it is the most fun to to experiment with. Uh, playing it alone is not that exciting, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I we also try to play it with some friends that were connected to each other and speaking while playing, uh, and they they managed to to actually uh, create some goals for them for themselves and. Uh, uh, it was nice to see many different styles of interactions with uh, different playtesters. And so you, you, you made it consciously, uh, I'd say, a, uh, an experience for mobile, right? So you wanted like more tactile, uh, you know, experience for it. Uh, it, it. Was that because you, you know, you felt that it was better fit for the format or was it because you, you like the, the, you know, the platform? Uh, we made it mobile mostly because we wanted it to be something that players can just join and hop in for a couple of minutes when they're waiting for something. And, you know, when you, you just pick out your mobile phone and maybe scroll Facebook instead, you can go and listen to some music or create some music with uh, some strangers and, uh, like, fill the, the void gap with something that maybe can make you feel more connected to someone else than just scrolling a feed that you don't really care about. Yeah, well, very well done and well executed. I think it's a very lovely toy, and you know, it fits both the time, uh, but it also fits, you know, like it's, you know, it's it's well, uh, I'd say it's well scoped. It's well positioned to be a small thing that you can spend, as you say, a little time with your friends uh, to, you know, to look at the screen and also try to set some goals and make some interesting music. So well done. Thank you. I agree with uh, Christoph. It's, it seems like a very cool little like thing that you can play around with, and that's super great. And also, I love the the art, the aesthetic of it. It's it's very nice. Um, so thank you, Alberto. And Thanks next up, we will have uh, Luis, who is presenting Pineapple, which I believe is uh, was first created as a Nordic Game Jam game. Um, last year yeah that right? yeah that, that is correct uh, so i will uh, share my screen and uh, so well here is pineapple it was as Matt said thank you for commenting it is a, a nordic game jam game for last year 
And we are now a group of five people. Uh, so uh, we have two designers, which are John O'Donnell, who appeared in uh, the files of Liam Red Squire, and Casper uh, Bunen. Uh, we also have three programmers, which are Rasmus Odegaard, uh, Dense Kovacs, and myself. And uh, so let me check one thing. So if, oh, uh, how do I, what's this? Okay, sure, sorry. So this is the presentation of Pineapple. And uh, as you uh, see, the you will see, the first thing that we went to is with this uh, kind of old aesthetic. And we want to show like having this kind of, um, yeah, retro vision of a game. And then you put a cartridge in and you get into a world where you have this character. And in these worlds, the main idea is that everything that you interact with, uh, you should be able to understand how to interact with things just by visually uh, looking at them. So the only words that we have in the game are actually to tell you how to play, uh, the, to, to move. Uh, but for example, there is nothing that tells you that you should go to the weird tile, but uh, it is different. So we try to go there and then we go and apply the rules and go to the tile. And then we have a new interaction and we go on and go to the next level. Then, uh, for example, in this second level, now we introduce the main mechanic of the game, which is where the puzzle relies. And in this main mechanic, what happens is, for example, in the first uh, move, I'll go to the right. And what will happen in this second move is that the first move that I applied last time will repeat in this time. So I will go right and up, as the sequencer tells. And now I'll go, my first move this turn will be up. And then I can go right to show. And then, for example, here we have these dotted lines. What these represents are worlds. So when I click move, you will see a little animation that tells you that you can now go, go through. Then you go up into the tile. And uh, as you saw in the beginning, there are multiple cartridges. Uh, the idea is that when you change a cartridge uh, and you insert it, and you change the world. So I will show you. I think there's just a little bit in this one in the beginning. And but so I'm going to the second world. Uh, what happens when you enter into a new world is that the aesthetics change and you are introduced with new mechanics. For example, in this case, we have uh, this new world where uh, what you See, is in the sequencer that you have below. It's a bit difficult to see, but it is a flat, uh, like going down figure. What this means is that your move is locked to going down forever in this move. So, for example, if I want to go left, what will happen is that it will go first down and then left, but it doesn't remember your left. Now you will go down again because it is locked. So, what I do now is just go down and down and then I finish. And yeah, and there is where we play with puzzles. Uh, for example, right now you will think in this world that if you go to the left, you will win. But what happens is since the bit is locked, when you actually try to do that, you first go down and you knock into the wall. And that is where we try to play with the puzzles, try to explore as much of this uh, little mechanic that we have thought of repeating what you have done in the past or locking it. and. Uh, explore with everything to see what we can come up with. And yeah, that is pineapple. So, uh, oh, so I can and uh, stop you, sure. Louis, that that seems cool. And I I like I like the new the new cartridges that since I saw it last time has been introduced. That's really cool. Yes. <laughs> what do you think, Christos? Uh, so, Luis, I, I tried the, the version that you have on it, uh, and you know, I can now also see that you, you know, you've worked even more on it. Uh, I have to say that it's, it, I mean, I can identify how much work it has gone into it. Both, like, you know, the grinding work to, to polish it, it's a very well crafted and a very well polished project, which is usually unusual for student projects. Uh, so, I, I appreciate that you put all that effort in it. Uh, and. And I, I know that the mechanics, you know, like in the, the type, the genre that you, you chose is not like, you know, the most innovative and the craziest of all the projects that, you know, that are probably going to be presented today. 
uh, but I can see, you know, like I can see the 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 I say the attention to detail that you brought you guys into it, and you know, and and I appreciate it a lot. So I think it's very very well uh, done. Um, so the only feedback that I had was, uh, and and I I think you probably removed it. I want to ask uh, from that earlier version was, you know, a little bit of a how do you say of an over eagerness to showcase some of the you know some of the, your thinking and some of the capabilities so i saw quite a few uh, particle effects and a little bit of glitz art that i i didn't see in your presentation today uh so uh was that intentional that you removed this or i we're not seeing them in the demo today no it, it is intentional we thought that it wasn't uh, giving the visual feedback that we are we were looking for so right now we are a uh, playing with different kind of uh, animations and we for now we don't have one but yeah we we try to move less from that particle effects that might be too much visual uh, things presented to the player that gets confused or uh, it is not nice in the end cool i'm happy to see i was even planning to tell a story about like you know one of my first uh, you know out of school le uh, you know lessons on uh, on uh, on on making uh, game development was one of the very first games i ever worked on uh, you know, we had some similar, you know, kind of flashy uh, particles. And then when we took it for the very first time for a review, like the very first thing that happened was that the play tester that we tested with almost, uh, you know, had an epileptic attack. So uh, it's something that, you you know, I know it's many times it can be a, an artistic statement, but you should always be careful uh, about overusing it. Yeah, <laughs> true. That's what we've learned. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I think uh, I I also really like the very the very highly polished version here you have, and uh, and I know that already from the from the Nordic Game Jam version, you you're focusing a lot on that. Like it was it was fairly high quality Game Jam project after like forty eight hours, so pretty uh, pretty impressive. Um, what are you planning? Like how many? levels are you planning like uh, cartridges i guess are you planning to have when you release 1.0 well the idea is that we are going to have uh, in 1.0 uh, would be uh, around 100 levels and then we will have five worlds uh, five different worlds and then in each world you will be introduced with a new mechanic and we are going to also play with the ones that we have presented in the past oh, okay that is the idea situation cool well um thank you so much Luis. it was super great uh to see pineapple again uh, thank you and uh our next project is going to be presented by matthias Wilson. um and it is a technical That's experiment all right all right Ready? I'm going to talk a bit about project I made this semester um, in the course Algorithms and Games. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so it is about procedural ten uh, generated terrain. And uh, I wanted to look further into how this actually works. And so I want to implement it myself. This was uh, made in Unity. And as you can see, we have the terrain here. And I can just generate more terrains as I see fit. This was uh, created with three types of uh, algorithms, namely the polynoise algorithm that you have probably seen before in the CGI. So I use this to define the altitude. Then I used another algorithm called the volley noise algorithm. It's an extension of uh, the Voronoi um, graph or diagram. And I use this for defining the humidity of my terrain. And lastly, to be able to have water at different levels in uh, different heights on my terrain, while still having the minimum height for each of them as to use the grass fire algorithm. I'll show you how this uh, works in the terrain. So if I go down here, you can see that uh, all the water here, they are at a certain height. Uh, it is kind of coherent. And this is uh, due to this grass fire algorithm that you should use for, um, for, for detecting objects on images. So the two different algorithms, the Perlin noise and the volley noise are working together to define how the humidity of this uh, terrain. So for instance, if I uh, turn on the climate, you can see the different uh, properties of the terrain. 
So for instance, I could start off by showing you the latitude. This should be just a y axis. And then um, we have the altitude, which is generated by the prelim noise. And lastly, the humidity. And using this together, you're able to actually define how it should look like. And uh, to give more of an impression of how this could be used in a game, you can also add flora. And uh, so if you go down here, you can see that uh, depending on the humidity and the latitude, that you get different types of uh, plants around here. Now I can change the height and the strength of each algorithm to see how they actually act. For instance, I can turn up the, the volume noise, how much it should use. Um, alternatively, I could try and turn off the Perlin noise to give an indication of uh, how they work each. So right now there's barely any Perlin noise applied. And then if I increase the the uh, latter, the magnitude of the volume noise, you can see that you get a very jagged terrain. And uh, if I chose to make this only snow, then this could also be used for different types of games. What I find interesting about those algorithms is that uh, they are so flexible and uh, you can combine them in any way you see fit to fit to a specific type of content in that uh, game you want to create. And uh, for instance, here you can also define the color of the the different um, regions. So if I turn the snow bag off or nearly bag off, then you can see that I can also define how the terrain should look like. And so I could create a more absurd type of terrain. And this is uh, th this could all work in real time. Right now, I'm be I'm doing it all on the CPU in one thread, so it's uh, it will definitely go much faster. And, other ways and uh, ways of defining how much water could occur in the terrain which is also defined by the humidity that may occur and we can actually break the terrain at the moment if it's possible and so here oh, if i just turn up the height here to 300 then you can also see the perlin noise on its own and how it works and these are different types of uh, different levels of layers that you apply to it and you can pay, make it more detailed this way. So yeah, uh, that is pretty much my project as I made it. Uh, I have the volume noise, but I didn't uh, show that one. So, that one. Uh, uh, there. Too much strength on it right now. Oh well, it's uh, too easy to do. There we go. All right, so you can also see the volume noise, how it is generated. This is the thing that uh, defines the humidity in the regions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Matthias. Um, yeah, this is this is an interesting uh, technical experiment. I mean, uh, and yeah, and you said you said you're running it on just on a single thread on the CPU right now, right? Yeah. Do you do experiments with running it on more more threaded etc uh no not at the moment but uh, if you want to make it run in real time i am certain that that is possible if you were to calculate the different humidity regions and uh, the perlin noise on the gpu for instance by using hardware acceleration then it would run so much faster mm -hmm. and then you could uh, practically have a game that is actually changing the terrain around you in real time as you play it okay. Persis, do you have a... Yeah, uh, I think I'm probably the least qualified person to talk about uh, terrain generation. Uh, but uh, nice that you showed, Matthias. Can, can you tell us, I mean, how, how would you see it being used in a, you know, because obviously you can use it to have some very nice time just toying around with the different uh, variables of the algorithms and creating very funky looking terrains. But how would you see this being used in a more, you know, non selfish manner yeah so for instance the perlin noise that i used that you saw with the green terrain that defines the height of the level that is actually used in minecraft uh, to define the terrain around there so it's uh, easy to apply to different types of games for instance also in another game no man's sky what they did there was that they had uh, fixed points for what they wanted to achieve uh, in the game for the player and then at the top of that they put all the procedure generation uh, generation to create the whole universe of that uh, that way 
And uh, this is quite interesting because I think that a lot of games could actually earn a lot of uh, using this more to maybe smoothen out the terrain or to make it more dynamic so that you don't always expect it to be what, uh, I mean, you are never, you might always be surprised how the terrain looks out suddenly and it always uh, fits together nicely. So it is uh, a matter of the abstraction in which you use this uh, algorithm and it, it has a lot of uses, I, I think. But would you see its strengths being used more, let's say, for you know larger scale terrains or smaller scale terrains? Meaning, like so. So what I tried here was using on a larger scale, and that did not fit that well because I wanted to get too many uh, parameters into one thing, and that did not work well. So I would definitely recommend to use it on those level, uh, low, low scale, and know what exactly it is that you want to generate, and then uh, design the the specific algorithms or tweak them to to work towards that better. Uh, so, for instance, if you were to generate mountains or just small uh, hills, then that would be two different approaches, I would say. Okay, cool. So, obviously, you spend a lot of time with it. I can tell, uh, you know, because you know it's you know it didn't crash and it is performing quite nicely. And you know, you you knew every single detail that you adjusted in the you know in the configuration. So, if you had let's say another five hundred hours, what would you improve on it? Um, yeah. So some things. Of First off, I would um, specifically jump away from the overall generation and try to put too much into one thing. I would be would, would look more into generating the uh, biomes first using the volume noise, and then based on the different biomes, I would have some kind of um, specifications for how it should generate the terrain to fit more into that specific type of biome, and then maybe have different types of uh, perlin noise to fit that better whether you have mountain or something else in a specific area. And that was something I certainly didn't have here. Uh, so these are things that you should really look into when you're creating this kind of fun. Cool. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, thank you, Matthias. I, I also, uh, I want to ask you if, um, which of the, the noise things, like which of the algorithms that you played around with here was the most surprising to you? Like, uh, so volume fun. noise, sorry. Yeah, and the most fun to deal with. Yeah, so volume noise, not, volume noise was not really that interesting because it's uh, pretty much just put random points on a 2D grid and then define all the distance from each pixel to that uh, point. And so you use that to define what should this area look like. Uh, while it has a lot of uses, I don't really think it's that interesting compared to, for instance, the noise, that is way more complex. and. Uh, See, can let you work with it in much uh, other ways than just generating uh, height maps, defining how the height should be on a terrain. You have so many other ways you can use it. So that was definitely the most interesting one of them. Cool. Well, thank you, Matthias. Um, next up, we will uh, have Massimiliano. Yeah. Uh, he will talk about settings the game. Um, so. Yeah. Let me see. Hello. Uh, hope that you can see my screen. We can see so, your screen. Yes. OK. Thank you for in your introduction. And I'm Massimiliano, has been said. And I'm here uh, to talk about settings the game. Um, uh, since I'm here in behalf of my team, I want, you, I want to introduce, introduce them to you uh, with this photo that we took during the making games. Uh, showcase uh, last semester. So what's settings the game? Settings the game is a puzzle game about uh, settings, game settings. I made a playthrough video that we are going to see together, and I'm going to talk uh, about the developing of the game. So um, since settings, uh, since setting setting in a game is not a traditional general puzzle game, we with a lot of effort in the first level to ease uh, the player to understand the logic of our game because we want them to feel comfortable while uh, going through the levels. The first setting that we introduce is the brightness because we felt that for us was uh, the most the settings that people would get uh, as easier to understand since it's something that we are that we already uh, are facing in uh, our life while using our devices. I want to pause for a sec because I want to highlight the fact that we put a lot of effort on trying to make the player understand what, what's the problem 
and trying to make them understand that they have to uh, um, play with the setting to go through the other level. In example, in this level, the apply button is an inactive position, so the player needs to play with the brightness to be able to click on the toggle and go to the next level. I don't know if you if you saw the the glitch that was there is also in this level, but we put that because we wanted to hint the player that he's not alone while playing the game and while going through this menu. So we also have introduced space, uh, as you can see in this level and in the other level, because we 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 wanted uh, uh, to remind uh, as the contrast and brightness calibrating methods that are used uh, that are usual in uh, some of the game, and we wanted to create a puzzle with them. We also use uh, cutscenes to uh, introduce the, this unknown entity to the player as a narrative tool because we wanted to create more absurd puzzle uh, with uh, the settings and we need something that uh, would corrupt our world and make it look uh, and make it uh, make it break so we could play with uh, new set not new settings but uh, play with the settings in another way. So the ritual here of clicking on the toggle to see the puzzle has been broken and it has been replaced with uh, um, uh, another type of uh, interaction. As you can see, now we are in the visual world, in the um, corrupted world. So uh, this level that we are we see that we're seeing now with the, the apply is has been the most difficult for player to play because we have uh, broke our own convention on the apply button and, and the player expectation of it. So the player needs to uh, drag the apply and go uh, and uh, to finish the level and to go through the next level that where he's have been teach to that, that where he's teach to collide with uh, the apply button on the other um, of the interface. As the corruption go, grow, grows, uh, everything starts to break. The brightness now is uh, affected by the gravity. The contrast is not you're not able to drag the contrast, so you have to click a, a button. And now you, with this uh, casting uh, that we are gonna skip, we introduce in the boss battle where everything is like all the rules that we have seen before are kind of break because the game was uh, really slow paced. You have to think what you have to do. You try the settings, but now uh, the brightness uh, uh, is also our life. So if uh, the heart falls down from the brightness bar, we lose a life and the, the player can, can lose. But it's also the the brightness bar and need to uh, be put down with uh, the contrast being put up to being able to click on the apply button behind the boss. This boss has three phases. The first two are really similar. The second one they just need to, you to apply the button, uh, to drag the apply on the button and click on it. And in, instead, the third one uh, is slow paced because there is no more urgency to finish the level. And something that we have noticed while doing play testing is that people still felt that they had to finish faster uh, as they could because they thought that the, 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 the heart was going down and they would die. Instead, they had to understand that they need to drag the, the heart on, uh, on top of where the arrow was and use it to click and go through um, uh, need to click and make it uh, make the contrast usable and click on the apply button. Uh, this was everything for our visual world. We had uh, in this iteration the boss uh, dies or not if you click, but in in the future we are uh, we are making new words uh, as uh, control uh, and sound because we had so many ideas while developing, but we tried to keep it scoped down. To make it as uh, polished as we could. Uh, so that was pretty much everything, I guess. And thank you. Thank you, Massimiliano. Um, that's really cool. It's it looks really fun to also play with that whole part of like the game that is settings and like play around with that as a theme song. So it seems like a very very fun thing to do. Um, yeah, um, I love it. It's, it's really, really cool. Uh, it's exactly the kind of game that I would have made. I probably end up making it back, you know, many years ago at ATU. Uh, I, I really like it because, you know, like I, I do think that, you know, being in a, 
uh, you know, and a master's about games is not only making very well polished the games, but it's also making a lot of you know meta games, and this is so meta in so many uh, ways. Uh, I, I love that you have thought you know very very thoroughly about how you wanted to make it. It's almost like a, a statement on more or less everything you've gone you know you've learned in this first year at IDU. So um, I, I I appreciate it uh, a lot. Um, so yeah, it it is it is very well uh, very well done. I, I I think that you know like the fact that you have to spend so much effort and words to explain it, you know, it says that you know again that you have thought about it uh, and that you wanted to say something with it, which makes it really really hard to explain. Uh, so, but I I'd like to hear more about you about that part, not like the mechanics and how it works, but what was it that you wanted to to say with it? Well, we, we wanted to explore another way of creating puzzle game. And the idea was from, uh, the initial idea was from Anne that she, she, pitched, she pitched it and like all of the team loved it. So we were like, we started to work on it. And I, I guess that uh, the main problem that we had, that we had to deal with scope because we had so many ideas that we wanted to put in the game. And then we had, we had so many controls that we wanted to try. So we had to be like, to uh, at some point we look in each other's face, we were like, maybe we are scoping this too much because we were like so excited to explore, our, uh, explore another type of uh, puzzle game uh, because we were playing with something that you usually see like one time or there are people that never go into the settings uh, menu, they just play the game straight away. But there are people instead that spend so much time because they maybe want the perfect setting because they don't want to lag and they want to play the FPS in the best way. So creating a game about that was pretty cool. And we like we were into it so much while we were developing. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, can, I can see it. I can see it in the result of your work that you, know, you were much into it. And you know, I, I can tell you, my opinion that you know it's not a commercially viable game, but it's one of these projects or you know, let's say things you you develop at school. You're gonna think of like many years afterwards, and you're gonna you know you're gonna have everyone that worked on it saying you know having you know a uh, conversation about how cool time it was and all the thoughts you wanted to put into it. So uh, I, I think you should be very happy and proud for it. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh... Also, it's 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 interesting to me. You you're talking about scope and like how all the different things, and you could already tell from like you said you had players that got stuck on like the third level or whatever because you you're breaking like the way that you have to interact, and one of the one of the pitfalls of of making games in the when you start out is like it's very easy to make very hard games. <laughs> it's kind of hard to make them understandable for people so that they can like actually play them um and i guess uh to that effect you 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 have you have the option of you know accessibility options is is a thing that's available in settings and maybe you you need that as your tutorial also to to get people to help people into the game right yeah there's uh th that's totally something that we have learned while developing the game because the first iteration was were really difficult because uh there there was less easing on the on on this on all the settings and all the mechanics so people were kind of unsure what were they playing with so we created these really let's say easy if i can pass this term levels so people can get used to it and understand how the game was paced and started to they started to like it more because they were more into it and they were wanted to see, oh, what, what I'm going to play with next on the next level. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, it, I guess it's similar to how you, you need ramping up when you're doing something where very different. Like, uh, for instance, Baba is you, like, takes the notion of, of, of Sokoban lights and, like, turns it on, a, like, adds the rules directly in the game world, right? And you're doing something similar. You're trying to display the rules and play around with them at the same time. That's that, that's really interesting. So, yeah. Um, thank you for this presentation, Massimiliano. Um, our last project that's coming up now is uh, our second Matthias of uh, of this hour. Uh, he is presenting Stranded Note.
Um, are you with us, Matthias? Indeed, I am. That's hello. good. Um, yeah, hello. I'm Matthias, um, and as part of uh, my thesis, um, I made a thesis. Um, oh, yeah, I'm not sharing screen. I'll show this in a second. I'll share a picture of my teammates. Uh, but first, I'll just quickly explain. Um, we were four people, and we made a thesis where we were examining how to to make a digital toy where you can interact with sound, but without necessarily being musical and without it being uh, a game. We wanted it to be more toy-like. So for that, we made a prototype that we kept iterating on and kept testing. And um, so, the, of course, the, the project was bigger than just a prototype, but that's what I'm going to be showing. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, can you see? I hope you can. Um, so this is the my lovely teammates. Um, this is Roxanne. She was a programmer on the project. This is Spencer. He was uh, another programmer. And uh, this is, of course, me. And this is Mia, who was a designer and also made a lot of the three, uh, made the 3D models and implemented a lot of the sound. I did a lot of the visual effects design and uh, um, some of the programming as well. And yeah, my parents brought, this is after our thesis, my parents brought flags and champagne. Yes, let's uh, jump into the game. And the uh, Easter egg is uh, for Liam Red Squire. I was also part of the team. So this is something I made back then. Anywho, um, so this is how it starts out. And uh, hopefully the player will click play because it's popping up and down. Um, and one thing that uh, kind of the project turned into uh, having a large focus on usability and how to actually teach the player without very much instructions. So there's only this instructions at the start, and then we, uh, we don't have any text really. So you're on this island uh, with clouds and some particles and different, uh, different trees, and there's a waterfall, and there's of course these glowing rings. And uh, one thing we implement in the game is this uh, UI system where everything you can interact with, um, there's like this uh, animated icon that shows up and show you how to do the action. So here you have to right click. And um, it's also contextual. For example, if I go to this, oh, uh, it shows up and it wasn't there before. So it only shows up once you can use it. And it's supposed to uh, teach the player how to, um, how to use these different uh, mechanics that we have. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm just going to show some of the interactions. So the part of the game here is that you can make yeah your, your own uh, kind of music pieces that loops. So I'm going to be making uh, just a short loop to demonstrate. So I can go over here. And then um, this corresponds to uh, the pitch. If it's up here, it's a higher pitch. And if it's down here, it's a lower pitch. And this corresponds to a, a five note scale. It's a C pentatonic scale uh, for anyone for who this is uh, Latin and they don't understand what pentatonic scale means. It just means that the note sounds nice together no matter what uh, order you take them in. So I'm just gonna take it here and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna turn this down. This is something you can use to adjust the volume. I hope it's not too loud. Um, and if you hold down the button, you can make longer notes. So you can see there's a note there now. And you can make uh, quarter notes. You can make eight notes, quarter notes, half notes, and whole notes. And um, there's also some UI here that shows you that you can delete it if you right click. Uh, it also gets highlighted uh, once you're hover over it. And as you can see, it sometimes lights up. It lights up once that note gets activated to communicate to the player that, um, yeah, that uh, what sound corresponds to which note. And um, also a big part of uh, this framework that we studied, uh, we built a framework around a lot of theory. And one of the central concepts was uh, synesthesia, uh, kind of binding visuals with sound. So that was a big thing that we tried to do. Um, so that's one of the stations. Let's uh, try this one. Just gonna turn this down. So, and if, for example, yeah, I make, let's say I make a note. Yeah, if I don't want that note, I can just delete it. <laughs> yes. So 
now we have a little uh, sound thing going on. I can adjust the volume, and uh, that corresponds to the visuals here. Um... And um, so these are the melodic elements. We also have percussive elements, which are these trees, um, where you can see there's like some UI to click it. So if we click it, we spawn some coconuts. And uh, these guys, they uh, look at you very strangely, but they also start to jump around in time with um, a beat. Um, I'm just gonna turn this controls their volume. So I'm also just gonna turn down that a little bit. And um, there's an internal sequence, so whenever you spawn something, it doesn't uh, get activated right away. It waits until it has, it's been slotted into the sequence. And as you may have noticed, there's different trees there. It's highlighted once you hover over them. And uh, they each spawn uh, different percussion sounds. So this can quickly get out of hand and be very chaotic. So we implemented kind of like a reset button in the form of a trash can. So if you click that, then uh, everything gets reset back to normal. Um, and uh, yeah, as you might also have noticed, there's uh, like a waterfall in the area over here. And that's, um, I'm just gonna build up a short music sequence again. And that's actually an area where you can apply effects to uh, the stuff you make. So I'm just gonna... like the piano sound, so I think that's going to be the most central. So now we have a little uh, groove going. So we can go in here, and we can see the UI pops up and tell us that to use this, we have to click and, and hold and then slide. So if we do that, then some other UI pops up here and we can apply an effect. Uh, this doesn't do anything right now because we need to uh, apply this other one here. And uh, now things start to get weird. If we just take this down, let's apply some reverb. Reverb always makes things feel dreamy. One thing, um, one thing we really tried to focus on, uh, we had a lot of ideas and we had a lot of testing. So we had one round of testing where we, um, we, we used uh, telemetry data uh, to get a lot of feedback on how uh, players were engaging with it and also some questionnaires. And then we built a second prototype of that, which we also got a lot of data back from. And, um, and we still found there's a lot of things that can improve. For example, the most interactive thing in our world is um, the music notes. Uh, probably also for, they're very highlighted, but people also understood this mechanic the best. And we found that uh, the percussion objects were not understood uh, as well. Um, and not everybody actually found them, which uh, we have various uh, hypotheses for why that is. But it was, um, 
it was a good way to test out this theoretical framework we built and we got a lot of useful data and there's still um, a lot of things that we would like to do with it. Uh, I just want to highlight one thing before I end it. Uh, one thing that's in the game, but uh, it's not really used to full extent, is uh, one synesthesia aspect is the more objects that are spawned, the more the particles effects actually uh, uh, gets affected. So if you watch the clouds right now, they're moving and the palms and the particles, they're moving at a certain speed. But if we just spawn, spawn a boatload of these, uh, it actually affects the shader and uh, the speed of the clouds and all the particles here and uh, yeah you see the clouds they start to go a lot faster a lot more wind and that's also an effect on the water it's a bit more hard to see but uh, um, yeah we uh, a lot of the other games we uh, analyzed they had a lot of this synesthesia aspects so that's something we also had some prototypes on we wanted to apply like uh, post-processing and kind of mess around with that but we had to scope that out of course because of time but that is uh, an aspect that we are very interested in um and i'm just gonna another aspect that um that is also obvious for uh, moving forward with this project is um to have an option to save the creations that you make and, and kind of have a social aspect where you can share with other people. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna go out and uh, thanks for watching. Yes, this was the telemetry that was uh, the play testers. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, that's a really exciting project. Um, really like the, the like, the, reminds me a little bit about a, a fract. And yeah, like, that was that 3D world like experiment. Really, really. That cool. was one of the games we looked at about 10, 12 different games, like VR games and 3D games. Um, yeah, that had uh, different ways of approaching of making like a, a sound toy, which is like the academic term. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm wondering, do do you have a a, a master volume rock? Because that seems like a thing that would be good. Uh, <laughs> yes, we should probably have had that, and uh, that was not was in there. Trash can, that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, I hope uh, I was audible. It's a bit hard for me to uh, to gauge. Um, uh, the the game uh, is on itch. You can download it there. I hope someone is sharing the link uh, somewhere, either in Twitch or in Discord. Uh, someone told me uh, it would be shared. <laughs> I hope Alex is on that on the chat. Yes. Yes. Um, also. So yeah, uh, Christos, what do you think about this? Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, interface for uh, an audio workstation. Uh, I, I used all my questions. I, I wanted to know which games you were inspired by because you used the term synesthesia a lot in your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to, to ask you, you know, you presented your team very early on. So are you the, you know, are you the audio, the music nerd in the team or everyone has kind of a needs? Um, we we were all interested in audio. That's kind of what brought us together. But we kind of had different, uh, a bit different approaches to it. So Mia, she was uh, she has like a composer background. So she did a lot of kind of like the theoretical, uh, like music theory uh, stuff. And uh, Bense, um, our programmer, he's actually going to another master now to study audio programming. So he had a, a strong interest in, in kind of making a sequencer and uh, how to uh, yeah how to map different things. Um, and I, um, I, had a, I had a great interest in, 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 in marrying the visual with the, with, with the sounds. And also I have a, also a great interest in sound design. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I suspected so, because you know, I, I can tell that there were you know, various aspects in your you know, little project that mm. uh, you know, they took it to different directions. And I can tell that they, each one, they had the nids uh, towards it. So uh cool yeah do we have time can i ask one more yeah I, you get one more okay <laughs> I, I, all right i'll make it short i want to i want to hear a little bit more about doing you know like the collaboration that you had between uh between you in the in the team like because you, yeah, you yeah. did quite a few things uh also you know you even play tested it and you know you did uh you know instrumentation of the telemetry and everything yeah we, we did quite a lot and we kind of uh so i was the like the resident project manager um so we kind of split it up a bit also the whole COVID uh, situation of course uh, but we had the um, roxanne she was uh, kind of responsible for the data gathering and implementing telemetry 
and uh, and of course also general programmer. Ben said he was kind of like the main programmer behind the sequencer, a lot of that stuff. And then Mia did most of the 3D, uh, kind of made the world. Uh, and I did I did all of the shaders and visual effects, and also some of the coding for the UI. Uh, so we had a very uh, collaborative process uh, about like we we of course used Trello and Slack, and we had a meeting every day. Um, where we set out tasks and, and kind of agreed on who would work in the scene. We also used a tool uh, called Plastic that would let us see in Unity if the scene was taken, which was very useful, especially from long distance work. And then we used a lot of the uh, one page designs to kind of communicate ideas to each other. Um, of course, yeah, we were kind of um, being pulled in, in some different directions because we had the different. Uh, a bit different ideas of what it could have been. We were also at some point more like, should it be more just be more of a learning game where you actually uh, like get to as a newbie understand what the music theory is behind it? But we went away from that. Um, so in the end, it was more of an explorative. You don't know music theory. You don't really know games necessarily. You can just like enjoy it and create something pleasurable. And um, oh. yeah. No, oh. thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Christos, for uh, joining us here for this hour. It was great having you here um and thank you for to all the presenters yeah uh, well done there. Wow. They, these were great projects and um, it's super exciting to see um yeah we have a short break now until like seven o'clock and then we'll be back with more games mm -hmm.